Another Monday means another Think Deeper podcast episode. Welcome in. I'm one of your hosts, Jack Wilkie, joined once again by Joe Wilkie, Will Harib. Uh, We're going to get into progressivism this week and really kind of how we move in that direction and and, uh, the the deceptiveness, I guess, that has has brought some bad ideas in the door. But before we get to that, I I just want to uh, really encourage you guys to go to focuspress.org when you do. Uh, our, our, that's our website. Uh, we've got the podcast, the articles, our, all our content material there. Uh, go to focuspress.org. Something will pop up. There's a email subscription leak. We, we love that you're subscribed to the podcast, but uh, we also want you to subscribe to our weekly emails. We only send one a week. We're not going to spam you to death, but I, I'm really excited. We've got so many projects in the works. Uh, Joe's got some videos that he's uh, putting up uh, for deeper Bible study. Uh, we've got books on the way. We've got uh, other podcast content we're planning out uh, for, for future podcasts, other shows. Um, that, there, there's a lot going on at Focus Press, and uh, we're excited to get that to you. We've got a new website uh, being built literally as we speak, um, and so... Uh, just all kinds of new stuff that we're, we're hoping will strengthen Christians, will, will lead people to Christ, um, things that you can share with your friends, uh, things that, that will strengthen you and your family and your, your church. And and so uh, if you would, uh, check that out, focuspress.org. Uh, when the subscription pop-up comes up, uh, give us your email address. We'll give you a free uh, digital issue of Think Magazine in exchange uh, as a thank you. Um, but, but take advantage of that. Uh, join us on the email list and... Uh, you'll get the latest every week, and, and again, I'm, I'm just really excited, and I think you guys will be excited too when you see what we've got going. But uh, I'm going to hand it over to Joe now to take us into this week's episode. This week we want to jump into what we're calling the Progressive Playbook, and it's something we've been kicking around for a long time, um, just talking to ourselves about it. We mentioned some things in, in previous podcasts of just kind of how the progressives have entered into the church, entered into our thinking, uh, and Obviously, with, with recent posts, our last podcast, we debated modesty. We talked about the modesty debate. And we saw some of these things, the progressive playbook, being used kind of against us, I guess, uh, with this modesty debate. And so Jack is the one that's kind of spearheaded this. We've talked about it. He's he's done a lot of research and a lot of thoughts, and, and he's very connected um, internet-wise and, and sees how the progressives have been using it, both in the world politically, obviously, we see a lot of it, but how that's really crept into the church. And so there's multiple facets to this. There's three main points that we want to hit today with the progressive playbook. Um, And so really to jump right in, I don't think we're going to waste any time. Real real quick, Joe, let me um, kind of elaborate a bit more, and then Jack will kick it to you with kind of this first question about kind of what we're talking about here with this progressive playbook. As somebody who uh, exclusively works, not exclusively, but I predominantly work with young people. Joe, you, you've taught a uh, youth class before for a good bit. Uh, it's close to a year, if I remember right, or maybe even more than that. Um, something that I've observed, and this is even with people that are my own age that I graduated with, it's, it's, the, it's what we've talked about before with the LGBTQ side of things. And just there's so much more acceptance and there's so much less of taking stances nowadays on what we know to be truth, right? 20, 30 years ago, if the Bible said something was true, you know, most your average Christian stood on on that that solid foundation of this is true. We're going to take that stance. Now, what we see right. is less of that, especially among young people, less of taking a stance and more of a, well, how can we, you know, package this in such a way as to not offend people? How can we uh, be more compassionate towards people? How can we be more loving and open? And of course, we're not arguing that we need to be jerks or harsh, but we don't take stances anymore. and It's a lot of, well, we're just going to accept everything. Again, young people, older people alike, but it really is the younger generations. So Jack, as we kick it to you to get this thing started, how is the door, or how has the door, I guess, been opened towards this leftward drift, towards this not really taking stances, towards this being accepting of a lot of different things that we know aren't true? Well, it starts off with, I think there's like a desire to be liked by the world, uh, which is not a, a biblical thing. Jesus said, they're going to hate you. They hated me. This is kind of the name of the game and how it works. And the other thing, there, there's kind of two sides of that, is you want the world to like you. You want it, it's, it's this idea that evangelism can't be possible if we get them to not like us, right? And so right, what we, we do become, is we have to... We have to become friends with everybody first, basically. 
Right, right. And and then the other assumption of that is that every non-Christian is progressive. Every non-Christian, you know, is doesn't have right conservative Christian biblical morals. And when I say conservative, I mean biblically conservative morals on marriage, on abortion, on, you know, whatever else. And that maps onto the political, but we're talking more on a biblical sense. And so what you do is you punch right. I mean, you hammer the issues of the people to your right hard. You know, we want the world to see us criticizing our own, criticizing uh, conservative people for their failings, you know, people who, biblical traditionalists, you know, for their failings. And then you engage the left and you ascribe good faith to people on the left. Well, you know, they're they're socialists, but they uh, it's because they care about people. And, you know, you're you just don't care about people. Money is your idol. If you're not, you know, like if you have a problem with this, um, we we when we did our Roe vs. Wade video, I pulled up um, tweets from Kim, uh, Tim Keller, uh, a New York City based Presbyterian guy, big name, lots of books sold. Uh, but he had this series of tweets on abortion. And it was basically, well, there's a lot of reasons, you know, good reasons that somebody might oppose outlawing abortion. And, you know, really the Bible just doesn't tell us one way or the other what we should do about abortion. And so Christians who take a hard stand and, and make it a big deal that we should outlaw abortion and, and ha, you know, condemn those that, that don't want abortion outlawed, that's, that's just the wrong step to take. And so look at, he's going after people who want laws against abortion, and he's softening up toward people who don't want laws against abortion. And and so it, this punch right, engage left, it's, it's an Overton window kind of thing. You're, you're, you're opening the window further toward the left, toward accepting more things, toward not taking biblical stands, and you're hammering uh, you know, the, the window shut on the right so that anybody right of you uh, on abortion, on LGBT, on things like that, um, you, they are bad faith actors. They are you know, taking it too far. They are not compassionate radical. towards the world. Yeah, they're radical. And, and so when you start that framing... Of course, things are going to drift left. Of course, things, you know, people people are going to start saying, boy, those those people that hold to the traditional views, the conservative views, those people that make a big deal out of it, they're not, they're, they're kind of divisive. They're not very nice. They're not, and, and so you're creating this drift just by, uh, again, the, the question you asked, how does the door, is the door open? You punch right, you engage left. You have good faith discussions with ideas towards your left and think, well, People believe these things for a good reason, and and the things to your right, no, that that's that's not very nice. That's harsh. That's you're Pharisaical. It's postmodernism uh, coming in at every turn, which is what is truth? Can we know truth? Is is there such no thing absolutes, as truth? Well, right. That's right. That's your truth, and so they're allowed to have their truth, and we'll kind of debate which ones. You know, yeah, that's that's their truth. This is my truth. We'll kind of debate as to why you believe your. No, 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 no. There's truth. We are both in pursuit of truth. Once we've found truth, we close We close on it, right? We say, yes, this is truth. We hold on for dear life. This is the exact opposite of, let's question everything. Can we really know? What if we have open and honest debates and discussions on these things, and we just hear each side out? Each side is not equal, okay? There is a side that's biblical. There is a side that's not. If you're not on the biblical side, get on it. And if you are on the biblical side, stand Let on it. Let me ask you guys this, and this might be a whole nother episode and might be a discussion that we don't need to delve into here but do you guys think that part of this that we're talking about here is the reason why so many even from conservative pulpits don't address hardcore issues anymore or at least if they do it's in a very politically correct manner it's it's in a uh we're not going to come down to i mean you, you see it with like modesty for instance you see it with uh just various forms of worldliness even from conservative pulpits nobody's really coming down hard on sin anymore on things that we know are true it's more of the uh, and again this might be a completely different discussion but it's more of the politically correct let's talk about loving each other let's you know kind of it's the fluffy sermons as opposed to the no we need to take a stance on this this is wrong and that we need to stop acting in this way you don't hear that as much anymore obviously that's a generalization but again i've been in the church for for 22 years and on average that's what we hear do you guys think this plays a part into that at all I think it's very much related because it, it comes from this idea of we've got to just keep lowering the bar. We've got to lower the bar, not call people to more, not call people to higher, holier living. Um, we've, we've just got to kind of keep lowering it to where the actions that you have, really, there's not much required of you. The beliefs, man, 
there's a lot of people that wouldn't become Christians if if they if they believe their church was going to tell them it's a sin to vote for abortion. There's a lot of people who you know might leave the church if we uh, really come down hard on divorce or you know uh, and remarriage or, or LGBT issues or, or whatever else. And so you know let's let's shy away from those things. Well, guess what? You've just opened the door for you've you've put that in the acceptable realm of beliefs. When you won't say that it's a problem, and so that window I'm talking about, you've you've opened it up, you've widened it leftward toward accepting these things in an attempt to have compassion, in an attempt to um, show that you're more welcoming. And it's really funny, the more progressive wings of Christianity. A few years ago, I, I think I've talked about this before. I wrote an article, Focus Press, uh, went semi-viral for Church of Christ numbers at the very least, and. Man, I got hammered uh, from the right wing of the church that I was, it was this whole big thing. And I'm not a progressive at all, obviously. You can hear me talk here. But they were casting me as that. Well, the progressive wing kind of reached out. Man, I'm sorry that happened. Jack, sorry. What, was just the, no grace what was the article side. about? Like, what, what, what were you getting uh, It was for? the one where I talked about, it was the dangerous trend in the, trend in the church. So we get so stuck on baptism That's and right. the instrument yep. that we don't, you know, push. And I'm not saying don't preach, you know, mu- you know acapella worship or, or baptism or, or these things that we believe and teach and that are very important. Um, I'm not saying that. I'm saying you got to move on, which we've talked on about on this podcast. Well, that, that made me the liberal of all liberals, right? And so the progressives in the Church of Christ came and kind of came over and they're like, man, we've been treated that way too. There's no grace on the right and and we've got grace over here until they found out that I was still to the right of them. Then all of a sudden they didn't have any grace for me whatsoever. When they say grace, they mean grace toward the woman who won't change how she dresses. They mean grace toward the person who really wants to have an open discussion about uh, if LGBT uh, uh, activity is allowed in the church. Or, you know, we'll have grace toward those people. We're not going to draw a line and be strong toward those people. And then we're going to hammer anybody who draws lines and, and takes stands. And so it's it's taking compassion and it's weaponizing it. I think that's, that's a term we want to get into is weaponized compassion uh, because it's such an effective tool. Everyone wants to be compassionate. So let's, I'll, I'll ask you, what is weaponized compassion? How is it used as this tool? How is that used? And I guess this is, for those listening, the second phase, I guess second question, just to kind of keep it in context. of This is the progressive playbook, right? And I think you hit on a key point with the weaponized compassion. There's a lot to this, but how is that used? Define that. Okay, so you look at this in our society. Why are so many people so quick to get offended? Why are so many, like, why uh, do people want to play the victim and, and portray themselves as put upon and all that? And you hear people talk about, oh, my, my trauma from the church, and I'm having to deconstruct my faith because of what the church did to me, and, and just these pats on the back of, oh, I'm so sorry. It's it's very, you know, you're I, all these people that don't go to church because the church was hard on them. No, they don't go to church because they're unrepentant sinners. They know that they're supposed to do it. Now, it's uh, I'm not saying that church abuse doesn't happen. I'm not saying that bad things don't happen in churches, but I am saying that's not an excuse to not obey God. We've created okay? a victim and, status, essentially. Yes, and, and, and so there's victim status across the board, and so you weaponize the compassion You know, of, of you're the person that's going to stand up for the victim and use them as almost like your human shield to get in the agendas that you want. And you see this in society, and you see it in the church. And, and really, it's based in... You'll, you'll hear these terms critical theory, which, you know, spins off into critical race theory, intersectionality, and, and what these are, it comes from Marxism. I mean, that people always dismiss that. It's not Marxist. It's not, it, it literally is. It's straight from that. You can follow the, right. the uh, ideological evolution of it over time. And what Marx looked at was power and, and money in society, capital, right? The, the oppressive capitalist people that are in power and keeping everybody down. The marginalized versus the privileged and and the oppressed, and we've got to rise up and we've got to flatten the playing field and all that, right? That was about money and power. What critical theory did was took that and applied it to the social sciences. All right, uh, the genders. You've got power. You've got oppression. You've got marginalized versus privilege. Uh, races. You've got marginalized and privilege of you know youth and and young and old. Marginalized and privilege. Uh, sexual orientation. Heterosexual versus LGBT. Marginalized and repressed. And so the oppressed people always have the upper hand in this because they are victimized. They are um, they've been put upon. And so we're we're trying to make everything right. And so we're going out of our way to accommodate right and so now you've got a victim and now you've got powerful people who are going to use those victims bring them along and say I- i'm standing up for this guy to get what i want and so let me give you an example i'm 
I'm doing most of the talking this time. I, I, I think that's, that's you. right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's right. Feminism in the church, egalitarian, women in pulpits. How do they run this playbook, the the, the weaponized compassion and the victim status uh, tool? Well, I, I remember reading a blog post on this of a, a preacher, very progressive preacher, I was writing and he said, you know what, my wife and I gave birth to a little girl, I mean, my wife gave birth to a little girl a couple years ago and our daughter, and I love her so much, and I just, I grieve over the fact that I've been part of this system of patriarchy that has said that women, you know, like my daughter, can't grow up to use their talents in the church. So she's a victim, she's a victim of a system, of systematic, systemic uh, sexism. And and so I've I've restudied it and, and I've opened it up or I've opened my views toward where we need to have women in the pulpits. We need to have women and elders. We need to have, you know, these these doors open toward them. And, and it's making it all about compassion. And here's the real why this works so well on people. If you stand up against that, what did you just do? How, how have they framed that? You stood up against compassion, that you're unloving, that you're not compassionate. You st- you're telling his little daughter she can't do something. You are, you know, this this little three-year-old girl that he's hiding behind, you're not fighting against him and the ideas he's pushing. You're fighting against her. How dare you do that? Okay? Well, the same thing with uh, LGBT stuff. Oh, these people have this attraction, and, and they're same-sex attracted Christians, and, and we need to just make room for, uh, like, uh, this is a temptation that they have, and, and God, you know, essentially God made them this way, and all the arguments that come out of that. And so... Who are we to just tell them you've got to be celibate? You've got to you you can't identify yourself by your sin. And so again, you hide behind them as a human shield. And guess what comes in behind the human shield is the bad ideology. So Joe, I'll I'll kick it to you here in just a second to talk about kind of what you've seen from a therapy perspective about this victim mentality. But I want to talk about kind of what all this builds up to. If you really go into this, the victim status and always looking at people as they're victims of something, and let's let's face it, we've seen that in our culture today. Everybody's a victim of something. Everybody wants to get offended about something. Everybody wants the victim label because what do we do to people who are victims? We coddle them, you know. We kind of try to massage the situation again. Don't 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 hurt them too much because look, they're victimized. They they've been they've been marginalized, and so apply, take that and apply that to somebody who who might view themselves as a victim of sin. Or if you always look at somebody as, well, they're a victim of sin, then what what can't you do? Because you want to coddle them. You want to make sure that they don't get offended. You can't ever call them to repent. Because to to do that would be to mean that you're taking advantage of their victim status, right? Of their marginalized status. And as Jack has pointed out already, we shy away from doing that if, if somebody has adopted kind of this victim mentality. And you see that again even within the church with this idea of brokenness culture, with this idea that, hey, you can't call anybody to repent because they view themselves as, as quote-unquote victims, victims of the church, victims of X, Y, Z. And so that that also speaks to my earlier point about maybe that's why we've started to shy away from it in the pulpit as much is because this victim mentality has crept into the church and has been adopted by so many people to the point where we can't call out sin anymore because, oh my goodness, we might offend somebody or they might leave, heaven forbid, and our numbers might go down. That you know, this That's part of this progressive playbook, and that's part of what we've seen in the church. Joe, take it to the therapy world, unless you have anything else to comment on that side, the, the church side of things. So you comment on that, but then also take it into th- to the uh, therapy world. What have you seen there? Sure. I think, you know, the idea of weaponized compassion, it's... Compassion's really good. Having compassion for one another and saying, man, you've been through a lot is is great. It's But there is a stopping point where you go, you've been through a lot, I feel horrible for you, but let's get you some help, right? We can't continue to stay in the same spot. And that, that speaks to the therapy part of it is it's okay to have compassion on others. It's okay to have compassion on yourself. We're called to have that, right? But it's also to what end, right? And I think this is the, the main point that we get into in therapy is Victim status is not healthy. It's not good because it constantly keeps you in a place of uh, you have no power, just a powerlessness, right? Everything is happening to you and you can't take control over it. So one of the first things we would do is figure out in what ways can we control what's going on in your life? And maybe we work through the trauma that you've been through. Jack, you spoke to it. A lot of people have been through trauma in the church. There's abuse. There's all sorts of things. We're not saying that doesn't happen. We're not saying we don't feel bad for those that, that that's happened to. I've worked with those people. Um, it is a, a tragedy. It's horrible. Uh, it shouldn't happen. At the same time, you you have to ask. After you've you've worked through the trauma, you've obviously given them compassion. You say, then what? Now what? Right? 
where do we go from here? We can't stay in the victim status. We can't stay where we're at. Maybe it happened to you. That's horrible. Let's work through it. And then let's come to a better understanding of ourselves and of other people because we can't stay in this marginalized group forever. And But the problem is there's power in being marginalized now. There's power in being, as, as Jack, you spoke to. So that causes people to say, well, there is no then what. I'm, I'm just a victim. And when I'm a victim, then I can call you out for victim shaming me. And it actually gives them power. So the very thing that victimization is all about, which is a lack of power, has become their power. That's why it's so difficult to get out of that, if that makes sense. Like, so you call that out a little bit. That's not true power. That's guilting people into giving you something that you can't give yourself. You need to give yourself love. You need to recognize that, man, there's a lot more. You need to call yourself to a higher standard. But if you can get everybody around you to kind of bow down and, and feel so sorry for you, then you kind of have that power over them. But that's not what you need. That's not what you want. So there's just so many, I, I think there's so many aspects to the weaponized compassion, but it is taking the natural good inclinations of people and the, those who are powerful, and especially those who are marginalized and the intersectionality and such, they they love that. They know that. They know that Christians are good people. And so when you bring it into the church, you have people that, um, well, we are talking off air. J.D. Greer, who is the former president of the SBC, Southern Baptist Convention, um, came out and, and, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about greed and, and idolatry and things like that, but it whispers about homosexuality. You know, what in the world? But that's what this is, is we want to have compassion toward those, those who are homosexual. Okay, compassion toward what? I want to have compassion toward the person, but not the sin. Can we call out the sin, but still say, man, you, you may have, you may be homosexual because of things you've been through in the past, whatever it may be. We have compassion on those things, but that's also not appropriate. That's not an appropriate outlet for what you've been well, through. Well, and that speaks to this that whole idea of avoiding the difficult truths, right? Of ev evading, evasiveness, right. you know, clear truths, clear truths that are difficult, clear truths that might offend. They aren't welcome. You know, we, we shy away from them because we're afraid of the offense that they're going to give. And so we, therefore, we have to be evasive with this stuff. Jack, I want to kick it to you about the, as we kind of delve into this evasiveness here. Before we get into the evasiveness part, because I think that's a really important one. It's a, a, an important, it's a good place to finish on the victim thing. I don't want to move on that off that just yet, because to the person who's not the victim, um, I, I want you to realize like that this is the game being played on you and you can either fall for it or not and and I'm I'm encouraging you not to and and here's how you know is will you uh, are you dedicated to the truth and what's right or uh, everyone wants to be that good person and the good person comes sometimes stands up for the the victimized person the marginalized person and it's important to to stand up for the marginalized in certain ways but on the other hand keeping them from the responsibility keeping them from and, and so we talk about brokenness culture oh we're all broken we're all just and so essentially we're all broken means we can't really call anybody to a higher standard because man we're all broken and if you call somebody to a higher standard, well, you're hypocrites because you're not perfect either. Nobody's perfect. That's not the point of Christian life. But if we're going to lead people toward holiness, you have to have expectations. You have to push people to more, toward more. You have to you raise have to say, the bar God has off given the ground. Us more. Right. We've got to raise the bar. And as I said at the start, it's that lowering the bar uh, in an attempt to look compassionate. Lowering the bar isn't compassion because... It, it, that is a works-based view of the gospel. Well, we as people, we just, we're broken and we can't do very much, and so let's just lower the bar as much as possible. The gospel is that God transforms you into somebody that can be somebody far holier than you ever could be on your own. But man, this this view where we just keep lowering the bar and, and toward marginalized people, victimized people, the person who struggles with LGBT sins, well, they just we've got to essentially accommodate. We've got to move the ball in their direction rather than calling them to, hey, there's, there's this standard here. Um, Telling women, no, you weren't called toward ministry. That's just how it is. You might feel that you're oppressed by the patriarchy. It doesn't matter. It's what God said, and you need to obey and be okay with it. Um, and and here's what He's given you in 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 its place. Um, you know the racial things that we're seeing of really. Uh, I mean, the Robin D'Angelo. Every white person is a racist, and you've got to uh, basically repent of your whiteness. And and uh, the other side of that is essentially, if you're from a ni minority race, you can't be held responsible and and you will literally have people say that only white people can be racist because of uh the mi minority majority the uh, minority majority uh, oppression privilege you know marginalization thing and so this it's viewing everything through power dynamics rather than through truth and you've got to get back to truth you remember uh, a few years ago 
I'm going to get into a little controversial thing here. But Since when do we We're ever shy away from that? <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. So it was. Right. I think it was Monday Night Football, the Steelers and Browns, and there was a dust up between the quarterback of the Steelers, Mason Rudolph, and Miles Garrett, uh, defensive line Miles Garrett of uh, the Cleveland Browns. Well, uh, uh, Rudolph's helmet gets knocked off. the The quarterback's helmet gets knocked off. He's a white guy. Miles Garrett, uh, a black man, takes the helmet and swings it at his head. Full force. A full grown NFL. You know, strong, athletic man connecting to another man's head with a helmet literally could have killed him on live TV in front of millions of people. Thankfully, he narrowly missed. It was awful. He got a suspension. It was it, he got in big trouble. He came out and said, "I did it because he called me a racial slur." It would not be okay if the man called him a racial slur. No one's here to defend that. On the other hand, in what world does somebody call you a racial slur? Does attempted murder become okay? But we had people right. running to litigate whether or not that was grounds for which he could do that. Right. Because he's a victim. He's oppressed. He's he's the minority in this interaction. And so it's okay if he does that. It's not okay if he does that. It is it is the far worse thing to try to kill somebody with a football helmet than to say a word that you should not say and that is offensive and is wrong. But when we're talking about which one's worse. But uh, that's just the truth. If you're looking at it from a plain truth, this is the worst thing. On the other hand, when you introduce the power dynamics, well, it's it's hard to say which one's worse. And so you can't well, say it's... truth, and then you've got all these people rushing in to defend the victim, the marginalized person, who discard truth and just, you know, but but it we have to reevaluate this all in terms of power dynamics. No, we don't. And so you think, why? how is this relevant? It's the same playbook that brings egalitarianism into the church, homosexuality into the church, um you know, pro-abortion politics into the church and, and things like that. Of, uh, I mean, the same thing when abortion was outlawed, so many Christians. Well, you know, I get why you want to outlaw it, but it's more important that we provide it so that, that people don't ever want to get an abortion, so that they don't have to, so they have a place to turn. Like, nobody's ever a sinner. Nobody is ever a, a person who chooses to do wrong. It's always that they're, they're put upon, they're a victim. No, no. Uh, you're just not a victim. And, and it's the same playbook that says you're not responsible for your actions because of where you are on the power hierarchy. And one other angle I want to add in all of this is the uh, the the idea that voices, you know, we got to listen to people's experiences and people's lived experiences. You'll hear that term is uh, is kind of like at the top of this hierarchy as well. And it's important to hear people's experiences, but one of the other things is people's experiences aren't truth. And then we get into this thing of, well, it's my truth. I got to speak my truth. Well, it's, I mean, Proverbs tells us the first that gives their case seems right until the second uh, uh, examines them. We just saw this with Amber Heard and Johnny Depp, right? Uh, and it was kind of the Me Too thing and believe all women. And, and they run out there and, and we've just, uh, she's the victim and, and the power hierarchy. I mean, she used that and, and that came up in the case. You know, uh, you're a man and, and you're like, who's going to believe you? And uh, so that tells us again, it's not about truth. And, and there's just so many things. Uh, again, um, We've got to listen to our women about what it feels like to not be allowed to preach. We've got to listen to the mother who had an abortion as to why it's like, well, it, but it doesn't make it okay. And it goes along with this empathy versus sympathy thing. Empathy is such a big deal that, well, we, we've just got to, you know, kind of get in the pit with the person. It's like, well, then you can't help the person. You need to help the person out of the pit, but you also need a grounding on solid ground to be able to help them. And that solid ground is the truth. And so lived experiences and, and that, you know, letting, uh, hearing people out hear people out but that doesn't their their experiences their stories the the things they've been through that doesn't triumph over the objective truths and so the question is which one are you going to start with and what you got to start with is the bible and say well here's what god says and if if your experience leads you to believe something different i'm sorry but i have to tell you you're wrong uh if if your experience adds to and helps me understand how to apply the bible okay that that's that's a different thing but uh, we start the other way around well let's hear people's truths and then let's build the truth around that and and so we end up here. And so the the victim, power hierarchy status, all of these things feed into the truth is not paramount anymore. That's the question. Do victims have responsibilities? And, and, that, and that goes to the to jump right thing. in. We talked about that. We did Correct. a video on the Enneagram. I'm a seven. And so if I just come in and run you over. That's just the way I am. That's just who I am. Yeah. Yeah. 
and, it's part and of again, my personality. you're a victim. You can't call me to responsibility. You can't call me to a higher standard. We're going to just keep lowering the bar for everybody. And, and what happens of that is you lower the doctrinal bar, and so your church stands for less. You lower the moral requirement bar. So like we talked about modesty, we're not going to take a stand on modesty. We're going to lower the, I mean, just across the board, and then you end up with nothing. You end up just being a very loosely connected to people who the only thing we have in common is that we're in the same building on Sunday mornings. It's horrible. So I'm going to go off. I'm going to go off on something briefly because we've talked about this. I don't know if this fits in the discussion or not. One of the reasons why I think we we struggle to stand for truth. This comes from we elevate niceness, right? The the eleventh commandment is thou shalt be nice. Seemingly, I think that's a, a that's what that's what I preached on um, Sunday night, Joe. Don't steal my reference. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. It's I'll not my you, reference. Uh, I'm just I'll kidding. let you no, take it from here. It. Yeah, no, you're good. Um, but. I think we've elevated the niceness, and what this comes from is, it does it not come from pulpits that are just, as you talked about, Will, afraid to say, well, you should just love God and love people. Love God and love people. So when we get in, we wade into these difficult discussions, we go, well, shouldn't you just love people? And, and you know, you somebody comes in and um, says, well, it's loving for you to accept me and my sin, and we go, well, you know, we're supposed to love our brothers and sisters, right? Well, it's loving to maybe take a little less stance on abortion because, man, these people have really been hurt. They're victims. They're this. They're that. And so it plays on the compassion. It plays on the thou shall love your neighbor as yourself. And we don't know the difference. And so when we don't actually get into the difficult things of what does it mean to first love God, that's the first one, and loving God is pursuing holiness. It's pursuing being right. like Right, what does Christ, it look right? like is the question then, we have to answer. Right. Somebody can Right. Somebody can come in and abuse the love your neighbor as yourself with this compassion, this weaponized compassion. And because preachers have done nothing but preach, you know, the love, 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 love. What is, uh, yeah, I was about to say, what is love, baby, don't hurt me. Sorry. <laughs> um, but, but what is Just what spare is our listeners there, Joe. We don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's, I uh, definitely, I'm not going to go too much further with that. But I think that's also a problem is we've had a lot of pulpits. So for the average person, they're sheep. They don't know. Uh, that sound that sounds mean, but we know this to be the case. So it, I, I call out the elders and I call out the preachers who don't preach on the tough subjects and who give in to this. That look at how many people. One more thing, I'll get off my soapbox, but this will also probably get us fired here, um, or canceled. Look at how many churches responded to the George Floyd riots, and these people are burning down. Innocent people's businesses, they are looting, they're rioting, they're stealing, they're doing all sorts of stuff, but it was justified. And you had preachers getting up in the pulpit talking about how this group had been marginalized and they're justified to do it. No doubt they've been through so much. I'm not saying that's not the case. I'm not going to make a comment on it. I'm saying, is it right that they're burning down businesses, rioting and looting, stealing, um, taking things that are not theirs all in the name of victimization, quote unquote? Come on. But preachers preachers would not preach against it because they were afraid of losing their job and stepping on toes. That's ridiculous. Well, for decades, we've hidden behind Ephesians 4.15 that talks about speaking the truth in love, right? For the average person that has heard sermons on that, what does that mean to them? So I'll speak the truth in love. It basically means be loving. And we've taken speak the truth in love and we've twisted that to mean don't speak the truth is basically what that has become. When the verse right before that in verse 14 talks about, hey, we should no longer be children, right? We shouldn't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and the trickery of men and deceitful plotting. No, we should know this stuff and we should speak the truth. Speak the truth out of love, right? But again, we've taken that and we've twisted it to mean, for, for speak the truth in love, to mean, hey, just just don't ever really speak the truth. Or if you do, you make sure and, again, massage it to the best of your abilities and maybe maybe twist the truth a little bit so that it's less offensive less and less hurtful. That's what we've taken speak the truth in love from Ephesians 4.15 to mean these days is that, hey, don't actually really speak the truth. But that's not at all what Paul's talking about. He's saying, hey, we shouldn't be children anymore. We shouldn't be tossed to and fro by all this stuff. We should speak the truth. We should speak it out of love for the purpose of growing up into all things who is the head, and that's Christ. And again, that's Ephesians 4, 14 and 15. But verses like that, the love your neighbor, as you guys have talked about, that's led us to, and I I don't know if we've uh, gotten to this third and final point about evasiveness or not yet, but I'll go ahead and jump us there if we haven't already. Um, that's That's what has led us to this point of the refusal to, to speak truth, the refusal to listen to truth, because we want to make sure that we're doing it in a overly loving and overly compassionate and understanding way. We have to define love. 
what is true? <laughs> I keep going back. <laughs> what is love? We have to define what about the love? loving thing Sorry. is to call. <laughs> Now Jack's got to get his in now. Yeah, if, uh, was it foreigner? I want to know what love is. So go ahead and tell us, Joe. <laughs> there you go. Um, but it is loving. Is it, is it not more loving to call a brother out in his sin, in speaking that truth, and in saying, hey, brother, brother, sister, you can't That's do that. That's what Paul's talking about. You, exactly. You know, yes. Exactly. And so that is out of love. It doesn't mean you're beating him upside the head. It doesn't mean you're not compassionate. But it does mean you are speaking the truth. And the greatest amount of love you can have is for their soul. And you're willing to call somebody out and say, brother, I, I believe you're in sin. And here's where the scriptures show. And if they don't take it, we, we do Matthew 18, right? And that's love. That's how we, we speak the truth in love. And you're right, Well, it's we're not saying, so for listeners, we are not saying don't preach the greatest and the second commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind, right, in differing, differing verses. And love your neighbor as yourself. We're not saying you don't preach those things. We're saying put some context to it. Because that's really, really broad when we don't get into the specifics of how we love one another. And so, yes, Will, to, to this third point, this evasiveness. What does evasiveness look like? Jack, I'm going I'm to hand over to you because there's a term associated that we've discussed and I think a lot of listeners wouldn't know and it's this idea of obfuscation and I want you to define that because I think that's that's critical to this discussion you can strangle the truth to death by wrapping it in a million qualifiers and, and all the new and nuance in the world and okay you know when you see a pharmaceutical commercial and it's like you know such and such you know helps you with your psoriasis or with your you know uh, your arthritis or whatever and then they get to the end and the guy talks really fast and there's like a paragraph on the screen of you know don't take this if this and don't take it and, and boy it might cost you this and you might actually drop dead if you take it and to ask your doctor uh, all, all of the fine print about it now imagine if the commercial was reversed and the fine print was the first 28 seconds of the commercial and the last two seconds was hey take this if you've got arthritis that's a, basically how we to preach and think it's preaching the truth in love well the bible says this i'm not saying this and I, i'm not saying that and and yeah you know, we got to make this qualifier for these people and we got to do this that, and the other thing uh, so we run into this all the time of people saying nuance or you're painting with a broad brush it's just too broad of a brush and so i, I made a post a while back about we've got a culture that doesn't know what marriage is for doesn't know what relationships are for doesn't know what children are for and that what god wants in most cases, this is a general truth. It's not a 100% truth, but it's a general truth. God wants you to get married and have kids, right? That's that's God's plan for mankind. That was Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. It's not good for man to be alone. We can apply all of these principles. Thus saith the Lord, you know, people should be pursuing that. Well, what about, what about, what about, what about? Okay, that's great. And, and we can have discussions about uh, those that, that haven't found a mate. We can have the discussion that some people do have the gift of celibacy. And so that they, they are like Paul. Okay, you've got that example of Paul. Yeah, that's there. Uh, you've got, you know, infertility. And, and so those that they can't have children. And we very much feel for them. But we've gotten to this point of you can't say get married and you can't say it's, it's good to have kids because it might, you know, or, or you can't say it without all the qualifiers about all these other things. It's very important to be able to just say, thus saith the Lord. Are there exceptions to a lot of these things? Yes. You can apply, you're, you're smart enough to apply the exceptions for yourself, and we've got to start counting on people to do these things for themselves, but they can't. Well, what about this? What about this? Uh, that's, that's too broad of a brush. We've got to be able to say the truth, and what ends up happening is you can't take a stand on anything. You end up not being able to say the simple truth because it got choked to death by all the fine print at the end of the commercial. You know, God wants you to get married. Don't get married if you're this, that, and you. Some people can't do the Canada. You know, we need the guy that reads the the stuff at the end of the pharmaceutical commercial to get up and preach these sermons because that's how they end up coming out. Be able to take general specific or general Bible truths and apply them specifically, and and we don't like that because well. That comes off kind of hard. Well, that might offend so and so, and so that we hide behind the victim, so you can't say the truth. I was gonna say that's the other thing that typically gets attacked is is the tone, right? The the tone of the message. You know, we attack the, the message might be one hundred percent true. Jack, you've run into this quite a bit, but somebody will get on and say, you know, I really don't think Jesus would have presented this in this manner. You know, we talked about this with the internet thing. I really don't think Jesus would have used sarcasm or or the the again the tone that you're using. And that's again speaks to what I preached on Sunday night. The idea that have you read Matthew twenty three? 
Have you, you know, read Peter's sermon in Acts 2 where he literally tells the Jews, yeah, you guys crucified Jesus. You know, he wasn't being evasive there. He wasn't hiding the truth and he wasn't really worried about his tone from what we can tell. Again, read Matthew 23 and the way Jesus lit into the Pharisees. And, and But again, we, we've gotten to this point of of thinking that we just have to be evasive when it comes to our tone, when it comes to the message itself. Even if the message is 100% true, we, we hide behind this idea of making sure that we are, again, speaking the truth in love, watching our tone. And again, we are not saying, here, here's one of those qualifiers, but we are not saying that we got to be jerks and that we got to get up there and be abrasive and yell at people and beat them over the head. That's not what we're saying. But what we're saying is truth is truth. Truth. We need to be able to truth without fear of people, you know, getting upset about the message, the content of the message, the tone of the message, etc. I, I don't think a lot of people, I don't think Jesus' disciples were, were pulling him aside going, you know, after Matthew 23, Jesus, you probably should have probably should have calmed down there. You used a bit, a bit too harsh of a tone there with those Pharisees after Matthew 23. No, you don't see that because he was Jesus and he was speaking truth. Yeah, I, I think I saw, a, I, well, first of all, I saw a great tweet a while back about the tone thing, and he said, I would be a lot more open to hearing the criticisms about tone if those people that are criticizing the tone were also saying the same truths in a different way. But usually, it's, I don't like your tone means I don't think you should say that thing. I don't think you should take a stand on that principle. Sorry. That's just what we're going to do. And you look at the prophets in the Old Testament. You look at, as you said, Jesus. And you look at, um, you know, Paul walking into Athens. You're like, yeah, you guys are worshiping all these gods. You got it wrong. Let me tell you about the actual God. He calls and it times of ignorance. the ability to say, yeah, and the ability to say you're wrong and God is right. And here's here's the truth from God. As I said earlier, the, thus saith the Lord. You think of Nathan the prophet standing before David. He didn't say, you know, David, I know it was hard. I know, here, I'll, I'll get us some credit back from the modesty thing. I know she was naked, David, and so, you know, it was, it was not your fault. Uh, you know, David, I, I know that, that sometimes sexual temptation, I know you had a lot on your plate, your guys were off at war, and no, he said, you stole what wasn't yours, you're the man, you're who I'm talking to, you've got a problem here, David, straight up. That was, and what we need in these times is prophetic voices, not not prophesying the future, but the ability to stand up and say, this is what God says to a people. And and you look through the minor prophets and all this idea of being winsome and nuanced and nicing people into the gospel and, and, and telling our, you know, coddling our congregations rather than saying, hey, stop doing that. Hey, put some clothes on. Hey, you need to do this. Read the minor prophets. There's not a winsomeness or a nuance there. It's you guys deserve every bit of what you're going to get if you don't repent. And with some of them, it's it's too late. Even if you repented now, you're toast because you are you have violated God's commandment. You have been adulterers against him. I mean, and so then we run into people who, oh boy, that... I don't like your tone. Or the world the world's just going to be driven away by you saying these things that, that are wrong. We have to realize the truth does two things. Boldly proclaiming the truth, again, with love, but that doesn't mean softening a nuance. Boldly proclaiming the truth is going to appeal and attract to those who are seeking. It's going to be the, the best thing in the world toward those who are seeking. Even if it steps on their toes, they're going to say, that's the word of God right there, and that's what I need. And it's going to drive away. Well, we should want to drive away those who are opposed to God with the word. And, and boy, that's something that people really, really are going to bristle against. But... This idea, you know, Jesus, he knew, when I tell you people, I, you're just here for a free meal, right. that a lot of six. them are going to go away. Right. Yeah, and the only people left were Peter and the ones that said, you've got the words of eternal life. The truth was appealing to them, so they stayed. The truth is off-putting to other people, and and what happens in that is the truth is off-putting to people, and we go, ooh, well, we're not, we're not supposed to be off-putting to anybody. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. And, and... In, in the right way, not in the being rude way and trying to, to smash people over the head, but in the way of, I took a stand for something, and you can either agree with it or you leave. There's the idea of strength in numbers, right? And I think we get that as we want more people in the church, and no doubt we do. Absolutely. We want the right people in the church. We want people who chase holiness. The strength in numbers, good luck telling the apostles that. There's 12 of them. Paul gets added. 13 men changed the entire world. Like, don't tell me about numbers here. You want, if it's a small group that is absolutely dedicated, and we've talked about this on the podcast before, so I don't want to you know, beat a dead horse, but if it's a small group that is fully dedicated, wholly dedicated to holiness, 
to being what God wants us to be, to being more like Christ, that'll change the world. You could have 10 million people who, you know, a couple of them, it, it's the whole 20%, 20-80 split, right? 20% do all the work or however, and sometimes I think that's more like 5-95% uh, where they do all the work. That's horrible. What's the point of the 95%? You show up, great, go home. This is not bread and circuses, you know, go home. You're here to take up your cross daily and to fight a war. And if you're not, then we don't need you. And that sounds really, really harsh, but that's the tone that Jesus took. And for those that are like, oh, would, would Jesus take that tone? It's like, read the Apostle Paul. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Have I become your enemy you see because how much I tell you the people truth? Yeah, Galatians 1. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. Like Galatians, he smacks those people upside the head. There's not one nice thing that he says in Galatians. He starts the book with, how are you already deserting the gospel? It's because that's what was needed in the time. When John writes Revelation, the, the letters to the churches, right? He comes out and, and to every church, he gives a little bit of nice or whatever. And there's a couple churches, uh, I shouldn't say to every church, there's a couple churches where it's like, you don't get any of that. Look, you have you have done this, 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 and he goes all the way down the line. And we are, Jack, as you, you correctly pointed out, I think we are in a thus saith the Lord time. This is a moment for thus saith the Lord. This is not a moment for soft peddling. This is not a moment for the evasiveness, for the winsomeness. This is a moment to stand up and say, here's truth. And for those who go, uh, watch your tone. Okay, we'll try to say it as, as nice as possible, but there is not some grander holiness because I backed down from the truth and tried to well, whisper it. The point it. here, Joe, and I'll let you continue, is that this progressive playbook, what we've been talking about this entire time, you know how the progressiveness has worked its way to the church, is they don't... They can't stand that type of talk, that thus saith the Lord stuff, because it makes people feel bad, it offends people, uh, it, it makes us less winsome. Some might right, leave. Some might leave. And so that's why this is such a big deal to us and why we felt the need to devote a full podcast episode to it is because if we allow this progressive playbook to be executed right to perfection, then they are going to eliminate this thus saith the Lord stuff. And again, as we talked about, pulpits are already doing that. It's, it's a lot of uh, generic. It's a lot of... Uh, ambiguity. It's a lot of love God, love others, and it's not any thus saith the Lord. That's a problem. And you know, we look at the numbers. Why are people walking away? Why are young people leaving the church? This is a huge reason because we've allowed this progressive playbook to be executed to perfection. We don't stand for anything, right? We don't. Those who who really abide by this don't really stand for anything. And in the world, they do. They know what they stand for. In the church, we have a lot of people just ask open and honest questions. We want to listen to the other side. And it's like, take a stand, man. And if you can't take a stand now when you're free to do so, what happens when we become Canada and you're thrown in prison for speaking against homosexuality? If you can't do it now, you think you're going to do it then? That's what Please. I was going to get at is there's a lot of people that have been trained under these things, under the victim thing, under the winsome, you know, um, you know, never offend the world, never make anybody feel bad with, with truths that they don't like. That they think that the 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 strategy that we need to employ is we said earlier the word evasiveness, not standing for anything and doing the whole oh well I'm you know basically shapeshifter you know whoever you're around oh well this I, I well I'm not going to take a stand you ran into this Joe with the the modesty thing that created some controversy and debating and you know somebody was very much criticizing our position on it but he wouldn't take a position himself well there's just a lot of ideas out there and you need to listen stand for something man and and we run into this a lot where uh, you know okay another thing another i'm going to bring up tim keller's name again he really championed the whole religion thing i'm not religious it's not religion it's a relationship and and as i've said before like it's really patting yourself on the back for being so clever that in a world that hates religion going and saying i'm not religious either i don't like religion either and they're going dude you're a high paid uh, pastor of a mega church in new york city don't tell me you don't like religion but man in your head it sounds so good that i can tell the world i hate religion too i'm one of you i'm just like you like Stand for something. Say, you know what? Religion is a good thing. It has been a blessing for the world. It's been a blessing for my life. We we owe God our, our duty in religion. James one twenty seven. Religion uh, is visiting widows and orphans. It's doing good things. It's carrying out the duties that we have toward others because of our Lord and because of all of these things. But no, oh man, being non-religious, being not, you know, being able to float and adapt and shape shift and 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 man, you'll see this. You'll you'll just see people have this argument. Well, I'm. As we said before, I'm not saying this. I'm not... Okay, what are you saying? Take a stand on something. And the inability to take a stand on anything, the inability to paint yourself and say, here I stand, I can do no other. Sorry, I'm going to quote Martin Luther there. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a heretic now, sorry. Uh, but this is right. Pretty sure this you were is, before this. True. This is right, and and so we've got to hold to it. 
that is so missing from Christianity. And and as we've said before on the whole concept of creating an us, how can we have an identity if we don't have things that we, if we don't have any flags planted, if we don't have anything that we're standing on and saying, this is who we are, this is right, and we're not going to compromise on it. But man, you think we'll get more people if we do this other thing, and so then you just end up being nothing. I thought we were supposed to be all things to all men. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that okay, means that's we're another, supposed to be shapeshifters. Yeah, that, that's another thing that gets as part of the truth and love and all things to all men is basically don't take a stand for anything because that's all. That's not what Paul was saying at all. Uh, you know, it was I can relate to all men, but he also went into the Jews, went into the Greeks, and told both of them repent. Jesus is Lord, and so. I, I don't know. I let, mean, let me, Will, do you have anything yeah, to add? I let think me we're ask starting you guys to wind down here. As we wind down, practical application steps for somebody that's listening. We have belabored the problem. We've talked about how big of a deal this is. I want you guys, and I'm kind of putting you on the spot. We actually don't have this in the outline here, but um, kind of putting you guys on the spot here. What are some practical steps? What are some application steps for member? And I'll, I'll start uh, for members of, of the church, for ministers, for elders. I'll start from the minist- from the minister perspective. If you're listening to this and, and you have the privilege of getting up and, and preaching God's word or teaching class, start saying hard truths. Stop shying away from from the things that are the, the tough topics, the controversial topics, right? Marriage, divorce, remarriage, modesty, uh, all, all the stuff that, you, you know, women's roles in the church, both in the church and in the home. Start speaking the hard truths. You know, it has become so easy to get up there and preach on the love of God and how much God loves us. And again, we should preach on that. There's nothing wrong with that. But man, it, it sure would be nice for it to become a widespread thing across the brotherhood that we're not shying away from anything that's tough. So for anybody that's listening, application-wise, practical steps, if you're a minister, start speaking hard truths. If you're a member and you and you don't get up and, and, and preach or anything like that, encourage your members or ministers, encourage your preachers to start saying the hard stuff. If they have a lesson that's maybe a bit more you know, step it on your toes, get up there and encourage them for it. Say, man, that really affected me. Yeah, that was tough to hear, but I needed that. You know, encourage them, hold them to a higher standard. If all they're preaching is cotton candy, encourage them to, you know, and exhort them to preach something a little tougher, preach something a little harder. That would be something I would say. What do you guys have to add to that as far as practical steps, application steps? I would say expect blowback. How many people do you see come out and they take a position? I just saw like James Patterson. He's a, he's a, um, and, and I don't care about the position one way or the other, but he came out and he said it's really difficult for white authors due to racism, whatever it is. I'm not saying one thing you know, for or against, but two days later after this, he comes back, he gets the blowback, and he comes back and apologizes for it. Dude, what did you think you were going to get? When you came out with that, stand behind it. If that's what you believe, stand behind it. You're not going to get a pat on the back from people when you come out with unpopular truths. And so that's what I would tell people listening to this is, whether it's unpopular or not, you may get dragged through the mud. You may have people absolutely hate you. Um, if it's truth, stand behind it. More to your point, Will. Stand up for those things. Be willing to say it, but don't back down. Don't apologize at the first sign of, hey, that you know, how could you say these things? Don't fall into the traps of the the weaponized compassion. Don't fall into the traps of the evasiveness, of the obfuscation of, you know, well, I don't like the, your tone, brother. I don't like your tone. You go, look. Forget about the tone. I'll try to say it as nicely as possible, but this is the truth. Don't back down. Don't apologize. You know what's going to be popular and what's not. Wade right into it. I don't see the reason to apologize, and that sounds like, uh, great, so you always think you're in the right. No, I don't always think I'm in the right, but I expect somebody to show me love and come to me and say, brother, according to the scriptures, you're wrong on this, and for me to have the heart to go, you know, you're right. That's what I'm asking them for, and so... Try to have an open mind, but at the same time, if you're wading into an un- uh, unpopular subject, stand for it, man. Don't back down at the first sign of somebody being ticked, because they will be. So that's my advice. Jack, how about you? I, I'll just make one on each of the three points we made. First of all, on the the punch right, engage left thing, realize not every non-Christian is a leftist who wants drag queen story hour and, and all like these wild things, and that we've got to you know really cozy up to them. There's a lot of people in this world right now who are looking at that going, this is crazy. This is awful. And there's a real opportunity for Christians to stand up and say, we agree. And now you've got an open door to them. You've got, and not that we should pander to one side or the other, but to realize if we speak the truth, it's going to be, as I said before, attractive to certain people and uh, off-putting to uh, other people. Just keep speaking the truth. Don't worry about which side of, of the aisle people are coming from. Number two, on the, the victim thing, I brought up the race thing and the, the thing with the football players for a reason. 
that's the really uncomfortable one, right? When we're talking about racial slurs being used and we're talking about, you know, uh, black and white conflict and, and things like that, uh, it's even weird to talk about. We've got to get our, our gag reflex out of here. We've got to get our our conditioning that says we, you know, the, 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 the whole victims keep us from speaking truth thing. And so, yeah, that was that was a weird rabbit trail even for me to go down. There's a reason. As long as we have this thing where we can't say obvious truths because we're worried about, uh, you know, the, the victim paradigm, the, the weaponized compassion thing, we are marks for being able to be led. We're, we're, we're perfect targets for what they're trying to do of in the church, the same thing, the weaponized compassion and, and just bringing in ideas. These things are all related because they're all the same playbook. They're all from the, the critical theory, intersectionality thing, whether it's race, uh, uh, male, female, LGBT, heterosexual, uh, all, all of these things that we're seeing coming in are using the exact same playbook. And so we've got to, to grow a backbone on those things and see how do you feel about those things? When you hear those things, you go, oh man, I don't know that we should say that. Or do you say, that's the truth. Be able to say the truth. And then the third thing, uh, I mean, it's, it's very similar, uh, again, on the evasiveness. Take a stand. It's okay. It, it feels good to take a stand, number one. Number two, people respect that. I think there are, are lost seekers who, when they see us be something, but if we continue to be nothing, if every time, you know, if we're one of those images that whatever angle you're looking at, is, uh, uh, it, it changes uh, depending on who's looking at it and where they stand, what are we, uh, what are we? You know, the, the church of Jesus Christ should be something very specific, something very notable that has its own culture, that has its own way of living. And as, as long as we keep shape shifting, that's not going to work. And so take stands. It's okay. Be nice. Uh, not, not be nice. Be loving. Be kind. Uh, be friendly where you can. But take stands and, and don't think that that's a bad thing. And so on each of those three points, that would, that would be my practical advice for uh, combating the progressive playbook. All right, with that, I think, fellas, is there anything else we want to... I think that wraps it up pretty well. Anything else we want to get into? That's all for me. All right. Well, thank you for listening. Uh, this has been another episode of the Think Deeper podcast. Um, make sure to like and subscribe. What you see on YouTube, uh, we will have another Think Fast, I believe, coming out um, shortly after this episode is dropped. And so uh, stay tuned for that. But uh, thank you for listening. We'll catch you next time.